Good morning and welcome to Oak Forest United Methodist Church this morning. We are glad that you're here to worship with us. Worship the Lord with gladness and come before him singing with joy. This week our announcements are that on Wednesday around 10, 10 30 we'll have the food pantry pickup and so if you're around and want to get in some exercise of your muscles we'll be here. We'd love your help on unloading that. And then on Friday, on September 10th, we're going to be having a drive-in movie. It'll be at 8 o'clock. We're going to be watching right at The Last Dragon. So you want to come just a little before 8 to grab your spot and get settled. Um, we're very excited about doing this event and doing it jointly with Wesley. So go ahead and prepare that to be on your calendars. Also, on September 12th, following church will be a BBS meeting. And it might be a little surprising to hear about BBS in the fall, but... We decided with everything going on with COVID, it'd be better to push that back. And so if you are interested in participating at BBS as a volunteer, plan on attending that meeting after church. Um, we're hoping that October we'll be able to have cool weather and be able to do some of that outside. So go ahead and plan to be there. But in the meantime, allow your hearts be prepared to worship as Tim leads us in the call to worship. We can trust God. God right now. Now. God loves all the people. The Lord who saved the outcast of this world. We can depend on God. God feeds the hungry, heals the sick, and restores relationships. Praise our loving God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Please remain standing as you are able and sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus, down on the back of your bullet.
come together as a community to lift up our hearts to the Lord? Are there prayers that we want to lift up this morning? Sarah is great. Sarah is great. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Davis Smith, or David. David Smith. David Smith. Lord, in your mercy, receive uh, our prayer. Randy Trotter and Campbell. Randy Trotter and Trotter. Trotter. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Let us turn and be in a time of prayer. God of all work, who created for six days and rested on the seventh. Bless all who work to create things of beauty and things of utility from the elements that you made from nothing. Divine Redeemer, direct and teach all who repair and renew what has been broken and what no longer works as it should. Bless those who care for people who cannot care for themselves. Healing Spirit, inspire with loving wisdom those who counsel any who have lost their way and are seeking new direction and are having trouble putting it all together. Head of the church, so enable your body to respond with fidelity to all that you command that your work may proceed with the little interruption and the goals you have set to be achieved in our community, in our world, which is yours. Governor of Covenors, bring a fuller measure of justice to our world, that the rights of all may be protected from childhood to old age, from the simplest worker to the most responsible manager. All are created in your image. Free us from any activity that is detriment to ourselves and to others. Grant us the joy in our work that we may have satisfaction in knowing that we do make a difference for good, benefiting the common mind. God, our creator, you have created people who go out to their work and to labor until the evening. We rejoice in both our vacation and our retirement. The rest at the end of the day is sweeter after a day of good work. The retirement at the end of years is satisfying when we can look back at it with what your work has helped to accomplish. We celebrate the rest you have prepared for the people of God. We rejoice in the memory of those who rest from their labor and their good works follow them to heaven by your gracious acceptance of Jesus Christ. May we not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life which the Son of Man will give. So by your earthly sacraments, prepare us for your heavenly rest, through Jesus Christ, who finished his work, to whom you and the Holy Spirit in all accord, praise and time, does not end. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
And so while he was in this upscale, exclusive part of the city at this church, he said that he was enjoying it, and as he was going around, he took a seat, and others moved away from him. No one greeted him, no one welcomed him, no one offered a handshake, no one spoke to them. They were appalled at his appearance and did not attempt to hide that fact. They said that there's many glances and frowns his direction of his shabby attire. There even came some wiggles and laughter made of his expense. And as he was leaving, the preacher stopped him and said to him, Before you come back here again, go and have a talk with God. And ask him what he thinks would be appropriate attire for worshiping in this church. The preacher had told him this, and he was assured, he assured the preacher that he would go and do just that. The very next Monday, the morning came, and the old cowboy showed back up for the service wearing the exact same outfit, ragged jeans, shirts, and boots. And once again, the congregation was appalled. And he was completely shunned and ignored once again. The preacher then noticed the man still wearing these clothes, and instead of beginning his sermon, he stepped down from the pulpit, and he walked over to the man, and he said, alone. He said, I thought I asked you to speak to God before you came back to our church. He responded, I did. And he said, if you spoke to God, what did he tell you about the proper attire for worshiping here? Well, sir, said the old cowboy, God told me he wouldn't have the slightest idea what was appropriate attire for worshiping in your church. He says that he's never been here before. <laughs> yeah, I know, it knocks the wind out of you. It's kind of amazing. You're like, oh no, but that's not what we want to hear. We wouldn't want that to be said about our congregation. We wouldn't want that to be said about ourselves, that God never lived inside of us. But when we look at James, we see even way back when they had these same issues of struggling with the rich, the poor, and appearances. And they had this encounter from James that we get a dose of what caused judgment and treatment of others. James then gives us this test case, right? Of this kind of same scenario of who gets to sit in certain places in the church as they worship. But we hope that we're overcoming it. We hope that we're countering it. And we hope we're doing better than that as a society because it really has been drilled into us to value people on the outward appearance more than the essential need. So what's fascinating about James' test case is that he seems to be talking to the poor, at least the working class. Look a little later on, it says, is it not the rich who oppress you in verse six? He's making a distinction between those folks out there who are rich and those who are poor. As I've been comparing this message, I've been thinking of a story from a former student of mine that um, she graduated with three different majors, very accomplished individual, and she went to Spain for one of those like summer intensive courses, and she was determined to learn Spanish. And she shared this story with me whenever she had came back, because it really just took her back, and she wasn't sure how to handle it. But one night, they were at dinner, and the professor had asked her what her plans would be after she graduated. So she mentioned that she's going to go to medical school and be a physician. She said, cue the bluntly put opinions, not just from the professor, but everyone at the table, about how doctors mostly end up just doing it for the money. And how even if they go in saying they're going to do it to help people, at the end of the day, that's all they want is the money. And so that people are really just too selfish. And so she mentioned that the whole reason for her learning Spanish is because that way she'd be able to work with her patients that maybe didn't speak English. And the professor shook her head vehemently, saying, no, you can't do that. She said that it was silly and that was wrong of her, but it was unfair to the patient because if she wasn't comfortably able to speak in both languages and be bilingual, then she's probably going to cause more harm because what if they use different words or slang and you could end up hurting them? So I told her that I understood that, but I had some communication ability with them to show that I maybe care and it also could create a clearer path of understanding. But it didn't matter how I responded. She said that it always seemed that it wasn't going to be fair to the patient. And so how, you know, you're showing false confidence and this is a horrible quality. And she said, that one really hurt my feelings because I tried explaining the best why I disagreed with her. 
because I was trying to be as transparent as possible that I personally wouldn't be able to handle that if I hurt someone. And so it didn't matter because there's all these preconceived ideas and opinions that outweigh whatever I have to say. And she said, if that weren't the case, why would I have said that? And even if not, then why would they have at least apologized or taken it back what they had said and hurt my feelings? Because surely they noticed my discomfort. And here she is in Spain with her classmates and hearing this. She said, I really felt this isolated, especially hearing from the Spanish professor that my whole motivation is flawed and almost meaningless. It really hurt. I'm sorry for wanting to understand my patients as best as I can. I know I won't be quite perfect in it, but at least maybe then I can be able to help them the best that I can. And so I had to read, kind of ask her about some of those questions, and that's the kind of summaration of that. But we all make distinctions, whether it's based on looks, socioeconomic status, or even people's attentions. We know that we shouldn't do this, but we have these preconceived notions that sometimes we don't realize influence how we're thinking. Yes, we make distinctions, but we forget the very crucial thing. Are we not all children of God? Because if we started recognizing that each of us were created in the image of God, should not stop all these things that are filled with evil thoughts or hate. Because instead, we should be filled with love of our neighbor because we can see God's light in them. Sadly, though, we still need work on this. Now, Dr. Dion Fulton does a lot of work around prejudice and making those kind of distinctions. She shared this story one time that as a health and PE teacher, one of her colleagues had a disability, and she said, I know she faced um, prejudice every day. But whenever I won an award at the school, that same colleague told me that the only reason that I had won was because I was black and pretty. It was at this moment that I took a step back and tried to understand why someone facing prejudice would then deduce another's achievement to just race and looks. And she was like, I was dumbfounded by this and decided I need to study this more. And so she's worked every day to try to encounter those with prejudice and figure out the best way of recognizing it in your own self and how to end it. She said that people's prejudice, she explained, comes from their households, cultural backgrounds, deep-seated perspectives and stereotypes shared about the world, personal experiences, and even ignorance. She says the best way to overcome prejudice is to become curious with yourself. Why don't you like that person? Who am I inviting into this conversation? Who am I avoiding? Why do I get that weird feeling around that person? How diverse are the people that I surround myself with? Once you're clear on why or what you maybe don't like about others, maybe you can figure out your own prejudice and then go against it and invite people that you maybe wouldn't usually talk to into the conversation. For James, then, at the heart of believing is how we view and then treat others. Do we somehow see some as more worthy of grace than others? Do we act as though these are those among us deserve a higher place, more attention, more service than others? That is what he is wrestling with here in our text this week. Making di um, distinctions, giving preferential treatments over one another, but the key for James in the early church was the distinction between the rich and the poor. That was his view of the problem that they were facing. With your acts, you see what you really believe. You can say you believe all kinds of things, but your life will bear witness to your beliefs, says James. He isn't saying that we are saved by our works, that always has been the warning in the midst of his. James is saying that the true faith has to come out in words and deeds. They have to match. It isn't just what resides in your own head, but what comes out through our hearts and our hands. So how are we being doers of the word? We must start by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Because when we do this, we should be sharing on equality of love, whether rich or poor, weak or strong, neighbor or not. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be the rich in faith, says James, and to be heirs of the kingdom that has promised to those who love him? In the 2011 film, The Iron Lady, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher 
which is portrayed by Mel Street, says, Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. What we think is what we become. According to James, how one treats others speaks volumes of not what they have become, but of what is most important to them. Of course, the famous line from James is faith without works is dead. Or, the Common English Bible translates it as, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. So make no excuses because there is work to do. But don't feel weary because it doesn't have to be the physical sense of work, but it must result in a faithful activity. So in the name of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Let us prepare our hearts as we prepare ourselves to receive communion. We lift up our hearts and give thanks to you, O God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. And Jesus Christ, your word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took it upon yourself and our sin and our death and destroyed their power forever. You raised the dead and from the same Jesus who now reigns with your glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. Jesus then took the bread as he gathered with his disciples on that last night. He broke the bread and gave thanks to his God and said, This is my body. Take and eat as often as you may in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and he blessed it and said, This is the drink of life. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink as often as you may in remembrance of me. Let us pray. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, and may they truly become the body and blood of Christ. And may they be the presence of the living Christ renewed in his body as we become Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at your table forever. Amen. Let us pray as we receive these elements. Holy Lord, we pray for all those that are present today and those that are not with us. Allow the two to come together in your spirit and allow us to go forth from living out these words of this blessing of this table. And may we live into your light and share it with others. Amen. You're invited as you're able to stand and sing the closing song forward through the ages.
after those songs, I feel like we've had worship this morning. If you agree, say amen. amen. I'm glad you all said amen. Otherwise, that would be really embarrassing for you, right? But we are glad that we're able to come and worship God. Allow us to go forward in this week, knowing and trusting the Lord and feeling that joy and presence in everything we do. Go forth loving God and sharing that with others. Amen. Amen. 